Now, now I just don't. I don't even really know what's going on here. I thought I could close that. All right, whatever. Okay, so what are we going to learn about today? Uh, more stuff, right? Because I know you guys are just definitely wanting to learn more stuff. We're going to learn about combating hostile forces of nature, right? So we've talked a little bit about this concept of natural selection, right? And over some time, uh, there are these, uh, what are they called, Jason? Selection pressures. Oh, selection pressures. Yeah, yeah, I know you know this because you sent me an email about it today. Uh, selection pressures, also known as selection forces, right? Yeah, it's a long day, that's okay. Uh, and over time, they're going to sort of uh, change and make adaptations, right? They, they, we develop things. So what we want to talk about today, though, are a few of those problems that humans have consistently faced over the uh, course of our existence. Think about some ways that we might have solved those problems. These are theories. There are, uh, I think what's important to take away from this is uh, the sort of the details of the theory in one sense, right? We want to think about that. But we also want to think about how we get to that theory, what are problems with that theory, what are ways we can test that theory, right? These might uh, give you some ideas about project ideas, right? And I know we have, uh, you guys provided me some information about your project ideas last week. I'm going to try to get you some feedback before the end of the class today, definitely by the end of this week, right? So you can think about that because uh, we need to be thinking about projects. And next week, something very important. Yes, exam, right? Yeah. Great job. <clears throat> All right. I think this is such a great um, slide for today, right? Because there are at least some of you who have mentioned this thing to me today, right? And if you look around, there are 21 people registered for this class. Anybody know how many people are out there in the audience right now? It's not 21. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 17, okay? So, uh, what is one thing that has been plaguing humans since before we were humans? Diseases, right? What happens when you get a disease? Please don't give me details. I just want very broad things uh, like you cannot perform at your peak capacity. You possibly die, right? So any of you dealing with a disease right now, there's your outlook, right? I know it's so positive. Uh, so one thing we want to think about, how many of you have ever been disgusted by something? Yeah, yeah, right? I mean, go ahead, be honest. It happens, right? Uh, how many of you have ever made what I like to call the dead pig face? Have you ever seen a dead pig on the side of the road? It's been rotting. Can you imagine that? What face would you make if you saw it? You got to get a lip quiver. That's really hard. You got to really kind of pull it down and work on it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I trained with a method actor for a while. Robert De Niro. I, no, I didn't. I, I thought about it. Krista, surprisingly, someone once told me I should have majored in theater when I was an undergrad. I think that was after they saw my transcript. Uh, no, I actually, I did a couple commercials for our like local TV station when I was an undergraduate. Yeah, yeah. I did, I, uh, Josh, I even did green screen work. Uh, yeah, I know. In front of the Eiffel Tower, I ate a loaf of bread. It was really, it was very, very convincing. Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, on a more positive note, I did some work for Habitat for Humanity. I did a, like a public service announcement for that. I did voiceover work on that commercial as well. Yeah, so. Uh, so the dead pig, anyway, there was a study a few years ago where they were like, hey, let's look at people's faces while they're experiencing different emotions. I don't want to get into this too much uh, because, Laura, you're going to hear this in a few weeks, right? And I don't want to ruin it now. I know, right? Exciting. Yeah. Uh, but they, they asked people questions from different cultures, and they said, hey, what kind of face would you make if you saw your friend who you hadn't seen in a while? What kind of face would you make if you found out a relative died, a relative you don't like? Um, 
what or I mean you do like right not one you don't like and then one of the questions I ask is what would you what face would you make if you saw a pig carcass that had been rotting on the side of the road for a few days and I like to call it yeah it's that face right there there it is that was it right there you did it perfectly thank you so much it's called the dead pig face right I'm sure there's a technical term for it but uh, it's it's the look of disgust right and we, we all do get disgusted by things and that's great uh, things that disgust us right tend to be things that carry diseases right or the potential to carry diseases how many of you uh, like human waste that's one anybody get disgusted by human waste you don't have to raise your hands we're just going to assume that that's true for most of us right if it wasn't true for most of us we'd all be dead right now that's not to say it's not true for everybody and there aren't exceptions to this right but in general it's a process that works um, and we do want to uh, again this is all to protect us from uh, the risk of disease, right? So some of this is called the uh, like the behavioral immune system, right? You guys familiar with that? So we have a, an internal immune system, right, of cells and things, but we also have behaviors that help us uh, with this as well. What's sort of interesting is that typically women find, uh, at least in, in the studies that have been done, find um, depictions of disease-carrying objects to be more disgusting than men do, right? And you might think, okay, well, why would that be, right? Uh, well, there's some really interesting ideas about that. One, women tend to be at a greater risk uh, for uh, contracting diseases during particular activities, right, such as sexual activities. Also, women have the capability to create, like, another member of our species inside of them, right? So it might make a lot of sense to, to be a little protective of that, right? So you guys can imagine your mothers, if your mothers weren't grossed out by stuff while, like, she was cooking you in her uterus, right? And all of a sudden she was like, hey, what's this? I'm just going to eat it and it makes me sick. Uh, it doesn't seem like a very effective strategy, right? So it kind of makes some sense. <laughs> what about attractive and unattractive faces? That's what's really interesting, right? Like faces. Man, we are really like face-oriented species, right? And we try to tell a lot about a person from their face, which is kind of interesting, right? That, uh, that you do that. So I don't want you to think too much about that. Um, what other things we do? These are all things we do to combat uh, toxins. One of these in particular that's interesting is pregnancy sickness, right? I think that's a particularly interesting sort of phenomenon. Um, what's really interesting about this is women who experience uh, pregnancy sickness are actually less likely to have spontaneous abortions than are women who don't have pregnancy sickness early in their uh, or early in their pregnancies, and it's like a threefold difference, uh, which is a, it's a pretty powerful difference, right? So if you think about that, uh, that really seems to be like there's some protective uh, factor with uh, pregnancy sickness, right? So that's pretty cool. Um, on top of that, I like to think about diarrhea just for fun. Uh, sorry for anybody that's you know in that category right now. Uh, what I like to, if you ever go to the doctor, which you should, right, uh, and you have a problem here and here, they'll often only stop one of those, right? The reason for that is we need to get those toxins out of your body, right? Uh, we need to get whatever it is that's making you sick, whatever microbe that is, whatever is lodged itself in your body out of you, right? And using that normal exit ramp makes a little bit more sense than the abnormal exit ramp, right? This is the down elevator. This is not an up elevator. <laughs> so uh, you shouldn't be vomiting, right? Vomiting is very, um, very uh, traumatic. Like from a muscular standpoint, the acid that's coming uh, through can do a lot of destruction to your esophagus. Your esophagus isn't really built for stomach acid. That's why it's not your stomach. That's why it doesn't hold stomach acid, right? right. Like your mouth is not built for stomach acid. Anybody have stomach acid in their mouths right now? No, you're not supposed to have it there, so don't put it there, right? Uh, this is serious, right, Katie? This is one of the um, uh, kind of a side story, uh, like eating disorders, right? Uh, vomiting with eating disorders is particularly uh, problematic because it causes teeth to fall out, rupturing blood vessels. I mean, it, it creates uh, some sort of secondary problems. All right. Uh, other ways that we can fight off diseases, right? How many of you love food with spices in it? Yeah, right, everybody does. Even if that spice is just pepper, right? Anybody put pepper on their food? 
Everybody puts pepper on everything, right? It's what you do. You put other spices on things. Uh, what's interesting is that spices kill uh, microorganisms, right? That's, that's pretty interesting. So things like garlic, onion, allspice, pepper, these, are, are shown, these have been shown to kill uh, microorganisms, which is exciting. Uh, one of the... Um, well, I thought that moved. Yeah. So one of the uh, other things we do to uh, kill microbes in our food, anybody know what that is? We've got a really awesome device that we use for this. Freezing. Well, I mean, I guess, yeah, freezing works. Refrigeration. Yeah. And then we also cook it, right? So that's another thing that we do. Uh, the problem is refrigeration is m much, much, much more recent than cooking. And cooking is relatively recent too, right? Compared to like when our species has, has been eating. How long do you think that we, if we were to go back, Jason, I want you to do a thought experiment here. How far back do you have to go until you get to someone that's not eating? Yeah, all the way, all, all, the, all the way, right? You got to go all the way back, right? All the way back, okay? So we've been eating this whole time. Uh, we've not been cooking. How far do you have to go back to, to find cooking? Well, there's some debates about this, right? Doesn't really matter, uh, but it's not been since all the way back, right? It's been relatively recently that we've been cooking. Uh, why would we cook? There are some real advantages to cooking. One is against, again, like killing microbes. The other thing is food that's cooked tends to be easier to digest. Right? We want to be able to suck out those nutrients. Although there's an interesting uh, sort of exception to this, and that's raw goats. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever eaten a raw goat before. Krista, you want to hear a raw goat story? This is a fun one. Uh, so there was this guy in Australia. So there's this huge debate right, about when did we start cooking, and did cooking allow us to have big brains or not. Right. So like this is like the thing that you want to figure out. Like, if you can pinpoint the exact day when a human just popped out with a big brain, you have cemented yourself in the pantheon of paleontology, right? You're done. They're going to name something after you, right? Because that that's like the key point when we became us, right, is when we got those giant complicated brains, right? It's a very important point. So a lot of folks say, well, that had to be after we started cooking because there's no way we could get enough nutrients from food that's not cooked to supply this big energy hog, right? Because at any given point, well, about 25% of your blood supply is going up to your brain. That's a lot, right? And if you start thinking about that and you're like, oh man, that much energy is going up there. How am I getting that much energy in my diet if I'm just like digging around for tubers and hoping to, to luck up on a patch of berries and maybe find a dead rabbit that's not going to disgust me to the point that I vomit, right? And I can eat that. And so if you're kind of living that lifestyle, and then, well, how am I getting this extra food? Well, a lot of the foods that, uh, that early hominids were eating, we seem to think they're very fibrous, right? Uh, how many of you have ever been told to eat more fiber in your diet? Well, like everybody, right? Whether that's good advice or bad advice, right? Um, things that are fibrous, right? Like what's a, f a very fibrous thing that you think you've eaten recently and you know you ate it recently because sometime after you ate it, you saw it again? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? There you go. Corn. <laughs> Great job, Paul. You didn't seem very excited about that, right? Uh, so things that are fibrous are difficult for us to digest. That's the point, right? Okay. And we don't get as many nutrients out of that as easily as something that's been cooked, right? And corn's sort of a weird example there, but it makes you think the right way. Uh, so we think, oh, we're going to cook stuff. It's going to be easier for us to digest. We get more nutrients. Then we can have big brains. So some relatively small-brained hominid, like, you know, rubbed two sticks together or started a fire or accidentally grabbed something that was on fire, probably more likely, and then tended that fire for some extended period of time until they were able to, you know, figure out how to make that work. Uh, there was a guy in Australia who was like, well, I'm not entirely sure we needed cooking before we got big brains because I think maybe raw food can give me just as much, right? Nutrients without putting in as much effort. So have you ever tried to eat a raw potato? Anybody try to do that one? Yeah, just for fun, right? I mean, you know, just like, why not? I just want to see. Yeah, but it's hard to eat compared to a cooked potato, right? Cooked potato is much easier to eat. So this guy in Australia said, hmm, here's what I'm going to do. For whatever reason, he didn't use potatoes. Uh, because potatoes don't provide a lot of extra nutrients, right? So he's like, well, I'm going to do it with goats. So he thought, well, I'm going to eat a raw goat, right? Uh, so this sounds exciting. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat a raw goat. Not only am I going to eat a raw goat, I'm going to chop this goat up using 
a stone tool. Because again, we have to try to replicate this, this whole... I know, right? It's like turning your stomach already. So he, he grew the... It was a sterile goat. And I don't mean sterile in the sense like it couldn't make more goats. I mean, they grew it. They like kept it in this environment where it was not going to get a, a pathogen, right? So that they could eat the meat. Uh, and so what they found is that if they cut the meat small enough, uh, they don't have to cook it in order to chew it up and absorb the... I know, right? Uh, chew it up and absorb the nutrients uh, effectively. So he... While his uh, work doesn't explicitly state we had big brains before we cooked, it does say cooking was not necessary for big brains. It doesn't mean it happened that way. He just simply demonstrated it could have happened that way, which is which is really, I don't know. Lab-grown goats. Yeah, Chandler, I, for some reason I knew you were going to ask a question. No, like of all the people in the world who are going to ask about raw goat meat, it's going to be you. It's almost irrelevant, but it's a useless statement. I recently was listening to so boil potatoes and then fry them yeah boil cool broth and so cooking like at certain areas help your gut well, how about that? So it makes it a potato. Just an interesting thing to write there. That was interesting, actually. What podcast was this? Um, it was Joe Rogan Experience. It was David Sinclair, I believe, but they talk about... We're going to give Chandler plus a podcast point. David Sinclair, he's... There you go. No, that, was, that was interesting. Uh, what else do we need to think about about cooking and spices? Again, your most widely used spices are the most powerful. Interestingly, uh, dishes in hotter climates tend to call for more spices than dishes in colder climates, right? So if you crack open your, you know, family Norwegian uh, recipe book, it's going to have two spices. You crack open your, you know, uh, Indian cuisine, it's going to have nine spices on average. Now, I don't know. This, this is where I'm like, huh, I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to think about what this guy's saying. Because I think this is important. Like, is this really some adaptation or is this just cultural? And that becomes very difficult to figure out, right? I think this is a key point where it's like, yeah, so we're using spices. We have, you know, maybe natural taste for spices. Did we adapt? You know, more spices, less spices. I don't know. You guys can think about that. Uh, food poisoning more frequently if you don't use spices. So you should spice everything that you eat, right? And then you're less likely to get food poisoning. It's practical advice. Anybody had food poisoning? Yeah, it's not a lot of fun, is it? I mean, I've seen other people experience it and laughed at them while they... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Don't answer this. Uh, how many people enjoy drinking alcohol? Uh, like most everybody, right? Uh, as a species, that's what we do. Uh, why? Well, there's some idea that fruit actually contains sugar and uh, ethanol. What can you do if you have sugar and uh, ethanol? Well, that tastes good, right? I mean, that's something kind of interesting. What other things besides fruit has sugar and ethanol in it? Like basically every alcoholic beverage out there, right? So you can kind of imagine why that is. Uh, we love ripe fruit. Probably the riper it is, uh, the slightly higher ethanol content, right? Not too much of a problem if you like weren't able to go to the grocery store and buy like giant bottles of just, you know, alcohol, right? If you were just like getting all your alcohol from ripe uh, apples, that's probably okay. It's probably a safe thing to do. But uh, when you start getting that from other sources, it can actually start to create some problems. In fact, uh, some people uh, drink so much alcohol that they uh, start to do uh, irreversible brain damage, right? Uh, so they have uh, Korsakoff syndrome which is uh, some amnesia as a result of vitamin deficiencies. Questions about fruit eating? Hey, you want to hear about a species that doesn't get drunk? So there's this, uh, it's called the nocturnal, or the pintail tree shrew, actually, is the name of it. I'm going to write this down for you. This is actually important. So the pintail tree shrew, uh, it's native to Southeast Asia. It's a nocturnal animal. 
the uh, tree shrew, there are no, like 14 species of tree shrews currently in existence. Uh, they originally were classified as primates, which that makes it exciting for us. Uh, then somebody said, no, they're probably not primates, and somebody said, well, maybe they are. And then there's like this constant debate back and forth, right? Where do we put these guys sort of phylogenetically speaking? Uh, anyway, they're, they're cool. They're um, not this particular species. This is the only nocturnal version. The other uh, species actually are diurnal. They actually have uh, color vision, not trichromatic, but they still have color vision, which is pretty cool. And Josh, this is exciting. They use primate-like problem-solving strategies uh, for something called the whole board, right? So there's a test you can give where it, it's really, it, I, I, based on the name, you'll never figure out what it is. It's a board with holes in it. So it's called, the, I know Chris, it's called the whole board. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll, they'll have an array of uh, holes and in those holes they'll they'll put a tree or or something else right and so one of the things that tree shrews likes they, they, they like they uh, love uh, mealworms you know, so they eat these little mealworms and you can kind of put them in different locations the tree shrews will search for those they'll actually use uh, a primate like strategy if you stick a rat in there they'll just kind of like randomly poke around and if they look upon one and you keep putting it in that same spot eventually they'll they'll remember where that is and they'll go to it uh, tree shrews on the other hand will use a slightly more systematic approach. Uh, which is what a primate would use, right? I mean, if you were, um, although some of you, I don't know, could fail this horribly. Um, if you were, if I was like, hey, randomly out there, you're just going to like pick one and then you might pick one and then you, but, but you're going to use some kind of strategy to that, right? You're not, you're not going to go back to the same one over and over again. A rat might do that thinking something has changed. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe they slipped a mealworm in there on me while I wasn't looking, right? Uh, tree shrews will use that primate. Sort of like show you. So they have very primate-like features. Neurologically speaking, they have uh, some things that only primates have, like big temporal lobes. Uh, so they're kind of cool. But the pintail tree shrew uh, loves fruit. Uh, loves fruit, right? And they have this interesting relationship with some of the fruit-bearing uh, plants that they eat. So they will eat the fruit, and uh, then they will just defecate, right? into the flower of the fruit, so they use it like a toilet, uh, which is interesting because that provides some fertilizer for the uh, fruit to grow. But the fruit um, <clears throat> actually uh, ferments before they eat it. So they're actually consuming high levels of alcohol, right? I know. And the interesting thing about this is you can give a pintail tree shrew uh, maybe like 10 times the amount of alcohol per body weight that you would give a human and like that human would like be, you know, falling over, having some difficulties maneuvering. And these pintail tree shrews, they can just like jump around and do all kinds of fun things. No noticeable uh, motor deficits. So they process uh, alcohol much faster. Their uh, liver enzymes uh, work much, much, much faster because they're used to eating that concentrated uh, fermented fruit. So there you go, right? Who got excited about that story? Chandler, I'm waiting on your hand. Yeah. There's also the, uh, the montane uh, tree shrew. There's the... Uh, Bellinger's tree shrew. There's the common tree shrew. There's the. Uh, do, you, do you need to know any more? Is that enough? That's probably. In, you can look them up. Uh, anyway, we've been eating fruit for a long time. Not a big deal. Hey, we already talked about morning sickness a little bit uh, with that embryo protection hypothesis, right? So I think the other thing you need to take away from this is you got to come up with a really cool name for your hypothesis, right? You can't go, hey, women vomit so their kids don't get, you know, like weird chemicals in their bloodstream. That does, that's not catchy, right? That's not catchy at all. So you got to call it the embryo protection hypothesis, right? <clears throat> so there you go. Uh, what's really kind of interesting is, is they, and they've done this across cultures, so I think this is an important sort of methodological approach. Like, how many of you know someone who's been pregnant and they had morning sickness? That's a fairly common thing, right? So that's great, fine, whatever. Uh, but does that happen to everybody, right? And so they, uh, across all the studies, they will go to different continents, different cultures, different ethnicities, and they'll say, hey, do your pregnant women vomit? And they do. Uh, almost every culture that's ever been tested for this, uh, morning sickness is, is a phenomenon that they experience. Uh, what's really interesting is uh, women are, who are uh, pregnant, they actually find foods that are more likely to be high in uh, toxins, more uh, repulsive, more repugnant, right? So like meats, uh, they're, uh, I don't, don't, don't want to eat meats. 
Uh, which is really kind of interesting because we often think of meats as having a high sort of nutrition. You, know, you got to eat that protein, you know, for like that brain development or whatever. Uh, women have there have been no reported cases of someone. Now I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but having uh, sort of uh, morning sickness associated with like uh, cereal grains, right? Okay, those are those are foods that are not likely to carry some kind of microorganism, some kind of toxin, right? Um, you can take a bowl of Cheerios and you can take a bowl of stew meat. And set them out at your house, and see, yeah, and see which one makes you do that face first, right? Uh, you're going to get the dead pig face faster on that uh, bowl of stew meat, right? That's raw stew meat, by the way. Even cooked stew meat doesn't really matter. You're still going to, right? Much, much faster. Okay. <clears throat> I think the other cool thing about this is just timing, right? And that's something we're going to talk about in a few moments when it comes to fears. Okay, uh, timing is is essential, right? If I'm saying that morning sickness is to protect the development of the embryo, that's what I'm saying. That's my statement. Then doesn't it seem to make sense that morning sickness should be strongest during the most important developmental time time frame? Hey, and guess what happens? It's a no brainer. That's exactly what happens, right? What I what I simultaneously love and also sort of hate about most uh, of these sort of evolutionary psychology theories is that on the one hand, they're, they're, they're so beautiful and they make so much sense and they're such a, a dovetailing, right? But on the other hand, they're like, it's almost like a, yeah, well, duh, I knew that kind of moment. And I think some people don't catch the the importance of that, right? The, the, the unique sort of nature of way this fits together and it only fits together because of now what were those things again Jason pressure. yeah right because of all those selection pressures over time in the yeah right that that drove that through that period of evolution right and without though that set of pressures and and the changing and some of those pressures change from time to time right over that over the course of that development of that adaptation but that's that's dialed it in exactly where it is now and assuming we were just phenomenal statisticians, we could, and we had all of the fossil record to go backwards, we could over at any, at any given moment, we could calculate the importance of any of those selection pressures on that adaptation, right? Because there may be more than one selection pressure uh, on that particular uh, adaptation, and we could calculate over time the uh, force of that. That's pretty exciting, right? Uh, anyway, so you have, uh, this occurs during that most vulnerable um, sort of time ends around the critical, you know, at the end of that critical period of development. And again, we already talked about women who do not have pregnancy sickness are three times more likely to experience a spontaneous abortion. All right. Here's a fun, controversial one, right? Man the Hunter. Anybody heard that? Yeah, how many of you like to hunt for things like your keys? <laughs> that's not that's uh, that's called man the forgetter. Uh, that, that's why you have to hunt for things. So there, how many of you have heard of hunter and gather, hunter gather societies? We've talked about that some, right? I'm sure you've heard of these things. Uh, so a few weeks ago, we talked about the influence of racism on these theories, right? Uh, but we should also think about the influence of sexism on these theories as well. And at the same time, though, we need to not, um, I don't want to use the word overcorrect. Yeah, I guess I do. We don't need to overcorrect, right? Uh, I, I like whatever the data is is what the data is, right? And we need to try to remove whatever bias we have behind that, right? If, if hunting was the most awesome thing that made us humans, then it's hunting, right? And there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, that doesn't make anybody any better or any worse than anybody else. That's just the way it went down, right? If it was gathering, then it was gathering, right? If it was the ability, you know, to grow hair coming out of your ears, whatever. It, it, it doesn't really matter what it is. There's no, there's no value on that, right? There's no like, oh, well, if you can grow hair in your ears, then you're much better than anybody else, right? Uh, it doesn't mean anything today, right? It's just, it's just, it doesn't mean that one group is better than the other, but this is the way things maybe happen. So we need to think about that. We need to keep that in mind, that we're not rejecting an idea because it's not a popular idea now, but also that we're not accepting an idea simply because we kind of have this 
this bias that we've heard over over time, right? Or, and by over time, I mean like over our lifetimes, right? Over the short lifetime we've been here. Does that make sense? And I think this is a good example of that. So early on, it was definitely man the hunter, right? Um, there were a bunch of men who were coming up with these ideas and like what's like the manliest thing you can do is like chase down a mastodon, right? I mean, I can't think of much, I mean, like if you're gonna list like the top 10 manliest things you can do, uh, chasing down a mastodon is pretty well up there, right? I mean, that's that's in the top five slots probably. Cause there, there are like four or five things you've gotta do to get that mastodon, right? Uh, coming in at number six is probably, yeah, I don't know, change a tire. I, I, I have no idea what's number six, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so there were a bunch of guys sitting around uh, primarily in these fields and they were thinking, hmm, you know, what's something really exciting? Uh, I bet hunting. Hunting is the thing that sort of separates us from other species. We have these coordinated hunts, right? We're able to go out. We're able to communicate with each other. Uh, if we weren't actually trying to do that as a species, we would have never developed language. We would have never developed culture. We would have never developed these awesome, like, spatial and mapping capabilities. Um, and, and, and while that may be true, right, uh, you have to think about what's the, the counter points to that, too, right? And you have to think about the other concepts and the other things that may also have driven um, uh, human evolution as well. So, but this is an important one, right? So let's just not throw it out just because it's not um, it's not popular today to, to think of something as exclusively one sex or the other. <clears throat> because I, I think uh, once you start to think about the other, because there's also the woman together, right? sort of approach. And I think once you start to think about both of these together, it's not always an either or sort of situation, right? If you were to think about like, how did we get to this point in the history of our species now? Um, it obviously was not solely because we were able to throw sticks at something and kill it, right? That in and of itself was, was yes, valuable to us, right? And some of the skills that are associated with that are still valuable to us, right? Uh, not, that, not that you're throwing sticks at things, right? But uh, making, uh, how many of you have ever made a complex three-dimensional spatial judgment? How, how many of you have ever driven a car? Yeah, right? So being able to throw a stick and kill something is something that's really important for your ability to drive a car, right? Because you're judging distances, you're ju judging location, right? And those are very, very important things for you to be able to do. So yeah, this makes some sense, right? That really fast sort of capability seems important, right? Also, I mean, if we had never been trying to throw sticks, you know how hard it'd be able to like put a shirt on? Uh, because you can't get your, you know, you gotta have that shoulder to get your shoulder joint to get your arm up there, right, Josh? It's a very important structure. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> hunting, possible, uh, possibly responsible for the evolution of human intelligence, language, tool making. Hunting has some cool uh, things. It gives you uh, sort of uh, an excess of food, right? Uh, quite often you're able to acquire uh, more food through hunting than you're able to use at any given time, right? So let's go back and think about a mastodon just because they're big. Uh, you can think of other, some, some other large uh, animal like a gazelle, right? That's a rather large animal. How many of you can eat a gazelle before the meat rots? Yeah, like none of you, right? <clears throat> so what are you going to do with the, that extra meat? Uh, probably one of the best things you should do, uh, there are a lot of things you can do, right? Uh, you can give it to someone. Okay, and that opens up the possibility for trades now and trades in the future. Now, there are arguments <clears throat> that only humans uh, are capable of these long-term sort of relationships, right? Where if I continually give you some food because I had a good hunt, then like the next time, like I don't do so well and, and you have some food, you can share that back with me. There's a small problem with that. And that problem is like other primates do the same thing, right? And so there, there are these, there are these long lasting relationships in other primate societies as well, right? Uh, now you don't see turtles doing this, right? So, okay. So that, you know, draw the line there, Josh. Bats, bats do. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So there are other examples of this, right? So I don't think that in and of itself doesn't really have the legs to stand on, right? That's not to say the other aspects of hunting are, you know, maybe unique to humans, but that one doesn't. Uh, maybe the things that humans do with that extra meat is is important, right? And the way that we've used that extra meat over time to acquire different sort of things and how that's, uh, in particular, related to mate preferences is, is kind of interesting. Is this about bats? Okay. Okay. Uh, 
print it, do like learning and blog or something like that. But if you don't train the dog and you start throwing them, they sometimes come back by themselves anyway. Yeah. I, so I don't, I don't know if I was like touch on that. And dogs are a weird one too. Anybody know why dogs might be a weird example? What have we done with dogs recently, Josh? Everything, right? <laughs> yeah, we've bred them the way we wanted. So, so dogs are sort of a unique situation there over the course of, of their evolutionary history since they went from non-domesticated dog to domesticated dog, right? Like French poodle or whatever. Are they French poodles? It's not a French poodle, is it? I don't know what they are. Different dogs. Chandler, you're going to correct me on dogs? No, they won't. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you did, that's fine. I don't care. Have you ever heard of the uh, stone leaf quiz? The I've what? The I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. It's called the stone leaf quiz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, that is an interesting one. Um, uh, Josh, Josh, do we do we want to answer that or not? I'm thinking about agriculture and dairy production and how that affects the cow persistence of the lactose genes. Oh, I mean, if it was. Yeah, I, I think that is I mean, and and the, and there's also I mean, I was thinking also epigenetic evidence of your behaviors now that affect the genes you and how they're expressed going forward. <sighs> yeah, I, 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 I mean, it's, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, sounds like a project idea. <laughs> Kayla's like, how am I going to test this one? Uh, you're lucky you're not in his group. I thought you said, hey, we should answer this, but we're like, that seems like a good project. Yeah, well, there's, there's a, st <laughs> you guys don't know Chandler like I do. Uh, and Josh knows Chandler as well. Uh, Chandler will sometimes ask questions you don't want to answer. It, it, it's, it's not that they're bad questions, they're just, how long do I want to spend talking about genetics and magic mushrooms, and 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 whether or not that granted our species intelligence. I, I, I mean, that's a. It is a very interesting topic, and 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 it's not out of the realm of possibility. We 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 have been using. How long have we been using drugs? That's a good question. Uh, you're going to ask that now. Yeah. Yeah. So. Not that long ago, there was a, a Neanderthal jaw that had been found. And so here we go. And there was an abscess in this jaw, right? So so we had, I don't know, has anybody ever, you don't have to answer this. Have you ever had a dental problem, like a toothache, an abscess? Anybody had a root canal, right? Okay, so that's what this guy was dealing with, except he didn't have a dentist. Instead of a dentist, he started chewing on willow bark. Anybody know what's in willow bark? Salicylic acid. Anybody know what salicylic acid goes in? It's like a pain reliever, right? It's, it's, you use it, I mean, we use it now to create over-the-counter pain medications. So here was this caveman uh, chewing on a, on, you know, taking a drug to, to, to solve a problem. And I think that's a really, I mean, I, 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 that's really pretty profound, I think, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty exciting. So, yeah. Who knows? It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So there you go. We are a drug using species. Maybe I was going to say maybe that draws that's the line between us and us, but there are other species that ingest certain foodstuffs to, to yeah. Yeah, or, huh? Yeah, yeah, or they, or to alleviate different kinds of problems. I mean, how many of you have had a dog eat grass? I, I mean, like the Bermuda kind. Um, it's Chandler's topic. I had to clarify what I meant there. Um, 
Yeah, so, so I don't know. I don't know. I, I, so there you go. I, I feel like other, I don't know. I feel like other species have, have lucked up on uh, hallucinogenic drugs over time. I mean, I feel like, like, because I mean, I mean, why would we be like all of a sudden like going out and like picking things and like, oh, I'm gonna eat that. Uh, it kind of had to happen accidentally once and somebody's like, whoa, man, that was awesome. I'm gonna tell my buddy about it and then my buddy's gonna do it and the next thing you know, right, it's a cultural phenomenon. Um, that's like, how many of you have ever seen or done a, a, a water bottle flip? Yeah, right, yeah, so there you go, right? And you're like, yeah, some idiot thought that was awesome and then the next thing you know, a bunch of other idiots think it's awesome and then everybody's doing it, right? Uh, and, and I'm, stuff happens like that, right? That's what I was saying earlier really about it being more of a, it's just something that happened over time without something that just Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Think about it. It's Start fun. All right, so uh, humans eat more meat than other primates. Well, that's exciting, right? Uh, one of the interesting things about, so that, a behavior like that, I mean, if it's something strictly a behavior, you like to back it up with something internal that drives that behavior, right, or that makes that make, behavior make some sense. One of the cool things about uh, humans is our digestive system, right? If you look at the digestive system of other primates, they've got like a big, like large intestine like that, right? And if you look at uh, humans, we've got one of these like small intestines, and then we've kind of got a large intestine. Uh, the small intestine is particularly well suited for extracting nutrients uh, from meats, right? And so not only do we eat more meat, but we eat more meat because we're able to get the nutrients from that, right? And so that's really uh, an important difference. Also, uh, anybody tried a vegetarian diet? You don't have to answer that. Nobody's going to, yeah. Uh, they're really popular these days, though, right? Like, which is fine. I, I mean, and I, and I think a uh, vegetarian diet is not necessarily a bad choice. You have to be careful how you do it. Don't just go, like, chewing on celery all day. Uh, because there are certain nutrients that are difficult to acquire from a purely vegetarian diet that humans need so that they can uh, survive. Okay? Uh, what are some other ideas about hunting? Why is hunting uh, sort of interesting? Well, let's take a step back. Human males tend to invest more in their children than other primates, right? Most other primates are like, I'm not sure that furry thing is mine. And so because I'm not quite sure, I'm going to move on about my business and just ignore it, right? Uh, although there are some, some, maybe some caveats here and there. Uh, but males tend to invest, human males tend to invest more in their um, children. So hunting makes some sense, right? If I can hunt and acquire a bunch of uh, meat, I can take that back and I can feed my family instead of just feeding me. There are also strong male coalitions. Again, I'm not quite convinced this or reciprocal altruism or maybe even the sexual division of labor are all that unique to humans, right? Even though these arguments are sometimes used to say, here's what makes humans cool and hunting did this for us, right? Uh, chimpanzees have strong male coalitions, right? They have, uh, they have strong female coalitions, in fact. Uh, and I think as we study primates more with an open eye, we will start to see that some of these things that we thought were exclusively human are not. Uh, and there's actually this guy, I think he's, um, he's uh, one of the leading voices in this sort of like, um, maybe humans aren't the coolest primates ever uh, kind of thing. Is uh, I don't think he would say it that way. But I think he's, he's working to say other primates are really just as interesting and there are a lot of behavioral, uh, there are a lot of behaviors we see in other primates if we just look and we actually bother to ask them the right questions. And it's uh, Franz de Waal. Uh, he actually uh, just, he just wrote an interesting book called Mama's Last Hug. It's about uh, uh, animal emotions, right? And it's about this chimpanzee, uh, kind of, her name was Mama. She was a really old chimpanzee uh, and then you know, one of her, uh, one of the experimenters that had worked with her while she was at the zoo and studied her for a long time, came back to see her right before she died. And she like went up and gave him a hug. And uh, well, a lot of people I think are really like, oh, well, that's really fascinating that this chimpanzee would hug a human. Well, it's, it's really not that fascinating on some other level because I mean, these are, chimpanzees aren't that much different than you. They just have to shave more. 
because uh, they're hairier. I mean, I mean, there's not there's not a, there's a thin line between humans and chimpanzees, right? I think when you think about it, um, and I think that's the the point of friends to wall is that hey that, that lines. Uh, smaller reciprocal altruism they, they do nice things for each other as well chimpanzees do right I mean that's like in exclusively humans and uh, sexual division of labor you also see in chimpanzees the males tend to be the ones who hunt chimpanzees are omnivorous so they will eat meats uh, and it's usually the males who are the ones who are going to do the hunting they actually um, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these clips they're actually kind of disturbing uh, because the chimpanzees will actually like uh, and gorillas do this too they'll attack like other primates, they'll attack and kill monkeys and eat them. So there you go. Hey, what about the show-off hypothesis? This makes a lot of sense. Anybody know somebody who, who tries to show off sometimes, right? Uh, you know, you, you look at that with some disdain. Like, I saw that on some faces out there, right? Uh, and what's really interesting about that is um, it's, it's, it's your fault. Uh, can I say that? That's kind of harsh. Uh, why why would someone want to show off? Because that's been successful in the past, right? And I don't mean in the past in their life. It's probably successful in someone else's life as well, right? So uh, by bringing in a large uh, hunt, you get that opportunity to show off, right? Like you're like dragging in a gazelle and you're like, look at this thing. This is awesome. I'm the coolest person ever. Uh, that's going to increase your status. We'll talk about that. We've got some chapters on status and so forth. Uh, and you can share with your neighbors... Uh, and then your neighbors can share things with you, right? And you might think of something you can share back and forth there, right? So I think one of the problems I had with this hypothesis is that they're like, oh, uh, and I think it goes back to the provisioning hypothesis. In some of these societies, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It, it, you know, they're, they're saying, oh, the problem with the provisioning hypothesis is why, why would one male want to try to feed other males? Or offspring, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. The problem with that is it doesn't take into account exactly what they're saying with the show-off hypothesis, right? And the point of the show-off hypothesis is if there's one male who brings in a lot of food, he also gets more mates. Um, and it's quite possible that some of those offspring that he's like feeding are his own, right? Even though they might belong to some other family group. Uh, and so I think in a situation where paternity is uncertain it makes a little more sense to feed other offspring because there's a chance that that offspring might be yours so I, I think that's not always accounted for uh, I've, I've seen some estimates that may be as, as high as, uh, as, as as one in four um, humans are, are the result of extra pair copulations that means one in four of you are calling the wrong person dad uh, just just to clarify what I meant there uh, which for some of you might be a relief, uh, you know, I <laughs> uh, hope it's that neighbor. <laughs> he seems like a decent person. Uh, and for some of you, that might be a little disturbing and you're going to go home and interrogate your parents. Right, Krista? I, I don't know if that, I'm just saying other people may do that. Not much, but particularly, I have no understanding about any of your family, so, and I don't really care to. I've got more important things I have to put in there, Jason. Okay, so if we talked about man the hunter, we should talk about woman the gatherer, right? Uh, hey, who remembers like this exact same sentence when we talked about hunting? Gathering is also possibly uh, an impetus for human intelligence, language, and tool making, right? So this is sort of the counter argument to hunting. And the argument for hunting is, hey, we made stone tools because we could use them to butcher animals. And then somebody else said, hey, you know, we were probably like smashing up roots before then. Wouldn't it have made sense to make a stone tool to smash up roots instead of like punching them with our fingers? And I, which I think is a really interesting, right, Miriam? That's a really interesting caveat there. I mean, I, well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I think I think some of these caveats to the to the gathering woman the gatherer hypothesis are not as strong as as they're sometimes passed off to be right and so I, I think both of these things are probably going on at the same time and I think a species that has multiple uh, resources resource streams is going to be a much stronger species than one that has a single stream right and so if you think about humans we can hunt and we can gather and that seems pretty awesome 
uh, that we can eat different types of foods, right? If you think about a, a species, if what if we could only eat, if we could only digest one type of food, and that sort of limits us if we run into problems with that food source, right? But we have a flexible um, sort of uh, dietary capabilities, right? Which I think is one reason you find you find sort of two species on just about every continent, right? Uh, except for maybe that one really cold one at the bottom. Uh, and and the uh, the animal that you find on all of those places, one of them is is humans, and the other one's rats. Uh, and both of us are are pretty good at eating just about anything, right? We have pretty flexible diets. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing to keep in mind. Uh, hey, what about spatial abilities, right? So this is some evidence uh, that's kind of interesting. So here's the short story because I do want to save a little time here. Uh, basically, if men and women had two different jobs, they would probably have evolved two different um, sets of adaptations, right? That makes some sense, right? If your job is to climb trees and somebody else's job is to dig holes, then you, you better have a different set of tools to do that, right? And so if men were hunting and women were gathering, then we would expect that there would be different sort of uh, uh, cognitive things that would support either of those activities, right? And one of those would be spatial capabilities. And what's really interesting is that uh, there are differences in the spatial capabilities of men and women. Uh, this is a, a f it's not a, a strong effect, but it's a fairly repeatable, robust effect, right? And that men uh, tend to be a bit better on tasks involving orientation and navigation, right? So if you're thinking about someone who started here today, but he had to go all of these places looking for an animal and then still make it back somehow so he can invest in his child, right? That's an important thing. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have someone who, um, let's say, started here, I don't know why that's so, uh, maybe that's because that's a highlighter. I don't want a highlighter. I want the pen. Started here and then uh, went like all of these places and then had to come back, but had to remember that at each of these locations was some valuable food source or a food source to avoid. You can see how those are two slightly different problems, right? And so women actually tend to be better uh, at involving uh, at tasks with uh, object arrays and location memory, right? So they tend to be better at that. And then men tend to be better at the, this other sort of spatial task. Not too big of a deal. Women are much better at uh, plants. Uh, like specific plant names. They test this often with plant names. Like, hey, which plant was here? Which plant was here? Which plant was here? Um, if you ask women, they'll tell you like three different kinds of plants. Men will go, well, that was a green one. Uh, and somewhere in between, there was a maybe another green one. I don't remember. <laughs> and I think this one had leaves. So those are the, the kind of, those are a little extreme, but those are the answers you get. Uh, even when you swap it up and you go like, okay, we're not going to actually use like real words. We're just going to like make up things that aren't real. Uh, women still do better at these spatial arrays. And again, this is on average, right? Okay. So there are some men who are really great at spatial arrays, and there are some women who are really great at throwing sticks at mastodons. But that's not usually the way that it is, right, on average. Does that make sense? So somebody's going to say, well, yeah, but what about? And I'm going to go like, yeah, but evolution, man. Uh, we're talking about so many years you can't write them down. So, I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, what about the savanna hypothesis, right? Hey, we lived in a savanna. Uh, this is sort of related to um, habitat preferences. Most people like natural environments over artificial environments. How many of you love this room compared to, uh, you know, like a nice spacious park? Yeah, you're going to pick the park, right? That's just the way it goes. Uh, also, savanna-like trees are preferred. We don't like things that are too dense because you can't see what's going to attack you. You don't want things that are too sparse because you don't get any protection from that, right? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is kind of getting a lot more sort of uh, play these days. Uh, stress reduction by spending time in nature, right? I think uh, lots of folks weren't necessarily thinking about that. There are a lot of people now prescribing nature, right? So I don't know, yeah, I don't know if you can get a, what kind of, 
I don't know. It is. Can, can, can you get like a prescription pad and like prescribe someone 30 minutes of nature a day? That's what I'm thinking, right? Like what's the, how do you get to be a nature prescriber? Uh, fun things. But yeah, absolutely, right? There's a ton of evidence that says you spend time in the green, your stress goes down. Okay. Uh, makes sense, right? Uh, how many of you have, um, you can think about any kind of wild animal, right? I mean, we're a wild animal uh, in some sense. We're an animal. Let's think about that. Uh, and if you were to put us in our natural environment, we would probably do better, right? So let's imagine you take a uh, turtle. I mean, everybody loves turtles. And you pluck that turtle up out of the pond, and then you stick it in an aquarium. Uh, is it going to be more stressed in that aquarium? Probably, right? Because that's not its natural environment. Okay. So when you put it back in its natural environment, turtle stress goes down. Uh, when you put a human in its natural environment, human stress goes down. I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? But somebody spent a long time figuring that out. Chandler, they should have just asked me about it. It's like turtles, cages, you're done. Don't worry about this too much. Uh, we do have to fend off uh, environmental dangers. There are like a million things you can do, right? Um, uh, stop. All right. Uh, freeze, run, fight, submit, like, hey, please don't kill me. Uh, you can get, like, really kind of scared, and then some, sometimes you can even pass out, right? This is sort of a, a progression, typically, from one to the other. All of these behaviors give us some value. Fear is, is, is um, a phenomenally great... Yeah, yeah, right? Selection pressure. Uh, what are things people tend to be afraid of? All right, everybody tell me your uh, biggest fears. I'm going to write these down. Spiders. spiders. Oh, it's already on the list. Spiders. Why would, why would we be afraid of spiders? Anybody know? Doesn't make any sense. They have a ton of legs. So you're, but we're not afraid of tables. I mean, tables have a lot of legs. <laughs> Well, all right, fair enough. Uh, so snakes and spiders uh, doesn't make a lot of sense in the state of West Virginia to be afraid of either of those, right? Anybody know, and you can combine the two, uh, how many species of snake and spider in um, the state of West Virginia can kill you? I think it's like, yeah, not really any, right? I mean, there, there may be a couple that can cause you problems, but nothing to really get concerned about, right? How many of you day to day are running across deadly snakes? None of you, right? N not, unless you are a herpetologist. I mean, I mean, I don't think you're, right? As someone who deals with reptiles, by the way, not someone who deals with, huh? Yeah, you bred them. Hmm. Paul's over here thinking about cooking snakes, isn't he? Because <laughs> he's like, breaded snakes and lemons. Hmm. Until I get off topic, yeah, but then they are like different, like different ones. Yeah, I was Gotcha. Aside from you, and those may not be deadly snakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? So they're part, yeah, right? So it's not a big deal. You don't have to worry about it. They're not venomous, right? Uh, However, we as a species came from a place with like a bunch of deadly snakes, right? A bunch of deadly spiders. And so uh, probably makes some evolutionary sense. Heights definitely will kill you, right? Anybody falling from somewhere really high? Anybody like falling down the stairs? I mean, that, that, that in and of itself will hurt, right? Uh, panic. Why would you be afraid of being panicked? What happens when you're panicked? Well, you're an easy target, right? I mean, if you get panicked, things can eat you. Uh, what's agoraphobia? That's a, afraid of going outside, right? So you don't want to get out of your shelter. Things can attack you. Uh, and small animal phobias. Anybody afraid of small animals? Anybody know why? Like, like what? I'm gonna draw like a rat. They got their little jagged teeth and little beady rat eyes. There you go. Uh, 
I think it looks like a minus a letter grade uh, for insulting my drawing skills. So no one's earning over a B in this class now. <clears throat> I know, right, Mary? You didn't even say anything, but these people are tearing you down. Uh, <laughs> hey, what comes with rats? Yeah, disease, right? Hey, remember that first slide we talked about, about avoiding disease? Yeah, these guys carry disease. You should always be afraid of rats, right? You know how many rats are in this building right now? Who knows, right? They're just like crawling around in the ceiling, probably crawling out your house, probably sleeping in your bed when you're not home, rolling their rat fur all over your pillow. Not at my house, just at yours. Uh, we're also afraid of disease. There we go. Separation anxiety, right? You don't like to be separated from uh, particularly like your mothers, right? It's a problem. I know, right? There you go. There's people that are already. Uh, strangers. Who's afraid of strangers? What can strangers do to you? They can kill you. <laughs> no, seriously, they can. In particular, uh, men, right? Uh, in particular, uh, uh, babies are afraid of strange men. Infanticide. Anybody heard of that one? That's killing babies. Infanticide is a, is a, is a common practice in a lot of species, um, including uh, other very close to us primates. Uh, it's, historically, it's probably been a common practice in humans. Not necessarily a common practice today. We have laws, right? Uh, but gorillas will do this. Gorillas, if they, if a male gorilla takes over a territory, that male gorilla will kill any of the nursing young, right? That way he can uh, sort of jumpstart the um, sort of fertility of the females, and then he can make his own offspring and not have to deal with those other, you know, leftover kids from somebody else. Uh, social anxiety. How many of you are afraid of social situations? Go ahead and stand up. <laughs> Nobody's going to do that. Uh, and then mating anxiety, right? Uh, and that's uh, all the way up to during and after. Uh, there, there can be a lot of anxiety there, right? Uh, what about kids? Kids understand predator and prey, not a big deal. I do want to talk to you about fever. How many of you love fevers? You should always, yeah, right? Fevers are awesome. They help you fight disease. Uh, how many of you have ever taken a medication to treat a fever? Yeah, you probably didn't need to, but you did anyway, uh, right? Now, you should watch, and I'm not saying just let a fever run forever because it'll, like, cook your brain and run it out your ears. Uh, there is a limit where you want to, like, kind of control that, right? Uh, also, how many of you take a, an iron supplement? Again, don't answer this. This is personal information. Uh, they'll give you iron supplements often because of, uh, you know, you all you got low iron in your blood, which is a, there is a, a threshold where that's a problem, right? But there's also a kind of a range where taking more iron is probably not good for you. Um, and it's probably not good for you because bacteria loves iron. And there are actually a number of studies where they've given uh, uh, certain um, uh, cultures like iron supplements because they were like, you're not eating enough iron. And then there's like this massive increase in the number of infections. Uh, that they have. So you, you got to think about that, right? So stop stop chewing on nails um, or whatever whatever it is you were doing to get your iron. Uh, stop taking it and see what happens. Actually, maybe talk to your doctor. Uh, hey, why do people die? <clears throat> this is really sort of an interesting uh, way of thinking about things, right? Be because if the whole point is like, hey, we need to like make more of us, right? Then, then why can't we just try to like live forever and just make a whole bunch more, right? Let's see how that probably doesn't work, right? Uh, there's this whole idea of uh, senescence, this theory of senescence that eventually things deteriorate over time. And that in and of itself doesn't, I mean, it's like, oh yeah, but that doesn't really get you very far. But what does get you somewhere is this concept of pleiotropy. Okay, this is when a gene can do two different things. Okay, and this is awesome. And testosterone is actually a really great, great uh, example here, right? What does testosterone do for you earlier in your life? Um, it it uh, <clears throat> increases your mating success, right? So having higher testosterone levels is uh, better. Uh, just about any time they. Uh, you know, ask for like, hey, what are attractive traits for males? You know, if you're a female and you want to mate with someone, traits that are related to high testosterone levels, right? 
uh, that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, you know, wider shoulders than hips, uh, deeper voice, uh, the ability to, you know, have some kind of kind of a beard growth or, you know, smelly armpits. Those are always, those are always great. Uh, anyway, uh, those testosterone markers, right? I mean, that's kind of how we got to having, uh, having what we have. The problem is, and this is probably not something many of you are thinking about, but some of you may be. And if some of you are, then you're, you're planning ahead. Yeah, how many of you have one of these? I could probably tell you how many of you have one of these, right? And I, I could probably count up who's got a prostate and who doesn't pretty quickly. Uh, if you have a prostate, that's awesome. Uh, so I'm, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Like six people in here have, right? Seven. Seven people here have a prostate is, is going to be my assumption. Uh, out of those seven people, like three of those people are going to have a problem with their prostate. Right? That's, that's, that's pretty high, right? That's a pretty high level. So about a third of um, uh, men have prostate problems when they get older, right? Why? It's uh, testosterone. So what will they give you uh, if you want to treat uh, prostate problems? It also treats hair loss. Yeah. Uh, so like uh, Propecia, is that what it's called? Hair loss. That's the pill you take, right? Is that, yeah, I don't know. I think that's it. Anyway, it is a. Uh, it also helps with prostate issues because it reduces testosterone levels. Uh, that's why you lose hair. Uh, it's related to testosterone. That's why you don't see hair loss as much in women as you do in men because it's a testosterone issue. Now you can't go around and find like bald guys and assume they have more testosterone. This is like a like a broad sort of category, right? Does that make sense? So don't think like, oh, when I get older, if you know. I'm not quite as attractive. I'm gonna start shaving my head so I look balder, so people will think I have more testosterone. That doesn't work that way, um, right? Because then there's some balance. That's a really interesting balance. Now I'm thinking about this. Who wants to do a project on hair loss? Nobody wants to do this because Chandler, this is for you. You can do this uh, next semester when you're, you know, bored. So, like, how many times have you seen a commercial for like, uh, like, like hair growth products, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And so now I'm thinking like there's like a whole industry of like male hair growth, right, and replacement. And so there's like this balance between like, you know, like appearing younger, but also like signaling you have testosterone and like what's the ideal amount of hair loss that's most attractive. Right, Mary? You, you see, you find this interesting now, right? You and Chandler. Extra group project. That's what you get for agreeing. Uh, but there's, there's probably some calculation on that, right? I don't know. What? I was somewhere else for a moment. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Uh, 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 cool thing, David Sinclair on my podcast talks about aging. <laughs> <laughs> he talks about how a lot of people were uh, stopping her. That's fascinating. Yeah, I know for a while there was some work on telomeres, uh, telomere length, right? And your telomeres kind of shorten over time, and then when they get too short, you're dead. I know. Hooray for long telomeres, I don't know. The Wharton School of Business uh, has told me I'm going to live to be 96, so I'm going to hold them to that. If I die before then, I'm going to sue. <laughs> <laughs> it was a life expectancy calculator. Have you ever done one of those? You should try one. So I keep figuring out how many years I have left. I got 60. Watch out. Uh, so anyway, uh, there are genes that help you now that hurt you later. This is actually a bigger... Um, it seems to be a bigger effect in males than it is in females. And the reason for that is a variability in reproductive success. So females sort of have, a, once you uh, are able to, to reproduce, up until the point you're not able to reproduce, it's, it, it's pretty much a steady state, right? Uh, you could try, but, you know, kind of top end, you're talking 12 to 15, right, offspring. Like that's that's if you're busy, right? And that's if you keep like a tight calendar and you got a lot of support, right? Twelve to fifteen, sort of, the, you know, you can squeeze a few more out, uh, but that's really it's really where we're going to set it, right? So you have about a dozen men. On the other hand, can can reproduce either 
uh, I don't know, upper limit, whatever, uh, lower limit, zero, right? So there's a lot of, there's more variability there, right? Also, uh, males tend to be more likely to be unsuccessful in mating than females, right? Uh, again, that's because females are the choosier because they have the bigger reproductive cells, right? Right, they're choosier. Oh, I thought you said choosier. <laughs> <laughs> nope, not what I said, Paul. <laughs> Not what I said at all. Just want to be clear, did not say juicy. Just gonna write that on there. Did not say juicier. I said choosier. Okay, completely different concept. So uh, they are the choosier, so they're going to be uh, more likely to be successful mating whenever they want to be, right? Whenever they make that choice. Uh, so it seems to be that it's going to be less uh, of an effect on females. That's why women live longer than men, right? Uh, they live a good number of years longer on average, right? Because you don't have that testosterone trying to kill you. Uh, what about suicide? Man, this is a real puzzle, right? That's why it says the puzzle of suicide. Um, and so there are a ton of theories about why folks might uh, want to commit suicide, how that fits into this, like you should live as long as you possibly can to reproduce as much as you possibly can. There are a number of things that folks have uh, studied looking at, you know, future health, uh, other problems, uh, prospects of mating, uh, being a burden to other uh, kin. Uh, kind of the interesting thing to take away from this is uh, no matter how bad things are now, the future is probably going to be better, right? So hang in there for that. That's going to be awesome. And if it's not, hang around to prove me wrong. That's always something you can do. Uh, I do want to have just a few slides here for anyone who um, is uh, contemplating suicide or knows someone who's contemplating suicide. I want to make sure I provide you with those resources because I don't like to bring up something uh, and then not provide you uh, with the resources you need. So there's a nice uh, three pamphlets. Where's the third one? There you go. Not only that, I have handouts. Everybody's getting one because, you know, that's the way it works. I think I have one of these for everybody, okay, if you want to start that. Uh, I don't have one of these for everybody. Krista, someone did not give me enough when I went upstairs. Uh, and I don't want to, like, randomly throw those at people, but maybe we could put some, uh, you know, for you to grab if you need one. They're great resources. Anybody thinking about suicide as a um, topic for your uh, project? Pamphlet. That's what it's going to be for. Does that work? Questions, comments, concerns?